Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're currently reading and discussing the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. I sure hope my listeners are enjoying the book, and more than that, learning the lessons of history. Now, we'll continue with our reading and discussion of the book The Papacy and the Civil Power. Yesterday, before the end of the program, we began our study of Chapter 6 of this book. It's entitled, Devotion to Liberty in the United States. And I'll back up one paragraph for continuity purposes to the beginning of the, of the chapter. R.W. Thompson says, Since the formation of our government, there has been among the people of the United States much discussion, and some of it angry and exciting involving the extent and distribution of civil power and the relations between the national government and that of the states. Yet no portion of them have been disposed to assail the fundamental principles upon which our institutions are founded. Their differences, although often radical and threatening, have hitherto failed to eradicate from their minds the strong attachment they have always borne to that form of popular freedom and sovereignty, which constitutes one of the most distinctive features in our plan of government. Even sectional jealousies and civil war, with all their terrible and deplorable consequences, and with the bad passions they invariably engender, have failed to destroy or weaken this attachment. And today, there is no single state in the Union which, if it were remodeling its domestic government, would not preserve the most sedulous care, with the most sedulous care, the separation of church and state, so that the people should remain the primary source of all civil power. If there is a single sentiment which has universality among all the lovers of our free institutions, it is this, the separation of church and state and that the people remain the civil power of this country. He said they cling to it with the affection like that of which the mother hugs her offspring to her bosom. And it is something of a tax upon their patience when they see this great principle, that is the, rule, the right of the people to rule, this great principle assailed at the bidding of a foreign power, we're talking about the Pope, Pope, particularly Pope Pius the or Pope, uh, uh, excuse me, Pope Pius the Ninth, who assailed our form of government and suggested that the government should be over the people and that the Pope should be over the government. Now, no matter whether that power is clothed in the robes of ecclesiastical or temporal royalty or both combined. R.W. Thompson and many of the people of the United States of America were incensed, were incensed at the Pope's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864. And they were not about to take any instruction from any foreign power, particularly that potentate, that self-arrogated potentate from Rome, Italy, who declared himself the vicar of Christ on earth, and it was his divine spiritual and temporal privilege owned only by him to direct the people and the governments of the world and to have them all serve his best interests. Now, R.W. Thompson continues. He says, Pope Pius IX has been of late years exceedingly fruitful of encyclical and apostolic letters intended for the double purpose of warning the nations and advising the faithful. He deemed it necessary to issue one when he rejected the guarantees of his spiritual freedom offered to him by the Italian government so as to notify the world of the reasons which prompted his refusal. It was dated May 15, 1871, and while less comprehensive than that which accompanied the syllabus of 1864, it is equally explicit in the claim that the civil principality, the civil power, that is the kingly authority 
of the Pope was conferred upon him not by any human concessions, but by the divine providence. In other words, by God himself. The Pope declares that, quote, all the prerogatives and all the rights of authority necessary to govern the universal church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, have been received by us, that is, the popes, in the person of the most blessed, Peter, directly from God himself, unquote. Hence, he cannot consent, that is, the pope cannot consent to be subject to the rule of another prince. For such deference to human authority would be violative of the divine decree. His reference here was directly to Victor Emmanuel, who by seizing upon his royal crown had in his eyes been guilty, that is, in the Pope's eyes, Victor Emmanuel had been guilty of an impious and sacrilegious act, punishable by excommunication. But the Pope looked even further than this. Realizing the necessity of stirring up the faithful Roman Catholics all over the world to a defense of his, that is, the Pope's temporal sovereignty, and possibly to a crusade for its restoration, he availed himself of the occasion to notify them that the wrongs inflicted upon him ha have, quote, redounded on the whole Christian commonwealth, unquote. That is, that as it is part of God's irreversible law that he should remain a temporal sovereign, the belief to that effect has become an essential part of the religious faith of the Roman Catholic Church, which must be maintained by all who desire to escape the papal malediction in this life and secure heaven in the next. In other words, Pope Pius IX said, My temporal authority is being assailed by Victor Emmanuel, who is a heretic and a rebel, who has arrogantly offered that I may maintain my spiritual authority, but not my temporal authority, which he has so impiously and heretically arrogated to himself, stripping me of my rightful divine right to rule over Italy and the papal states and the rest of the world. I tell you now, I got my authority from God. It came from no human institution. Victor Emmanuel is ex ipso facto excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, and I call every Roman Catholic all over the world, if you want to prevent the assail, the, the, the divine right privilege of the Pope of excommunication, if you want to secure eternal life in the future and temporal freedom in this life, then it is incumbent upon you to defend my rights. To join me in a crusade to overthrow Victor Emmanuel and anybody else who thinks their pants are big enough to replace mine. Do you see what power the papacy has? To call to crusade the Catholics of the world to rise up against their own governments on pain of excommunication and eternal salvation or damnation, as the case may be, to defend the Pope's rights to rule the world by divine right. That's the power of the Pope. That's the temporal power of the Pope. He can tell the Roman Catholics of every nation of the world to rise up against their governments in rebellion, to overthrow those governments, and to put the Pope supreme over that government. It's a belief that his uh, temporal authority is divinely given. He receives it from no human institution. 
And anybody who threatens his temporal authority has also threatened his spiritual authority because the temporal authority is necessary for him to be able to freely exercise his spiritual authority. Now, the Pope looked also to the consequences of this doctrine, which logically gave precisely the same universality to both his spiritual and temporal power, so that where one is, the other must be also. If God gave, quote, civil principality, unquote, to Peter in order that he might establish the church, then the conclusion is inevitable that the same civil power which Peter possessed is necessary to govern the church not only at Rome, but everywhere else. And it must be possessed in the same degree in all parts of the world. For whatever is necessary to preserve and advance Christianity at one place is equally so for the same purposes at all other places. The faith and the church, is the pap- as the papists insist, must both be unchanging. The whole Christian commonwealth must be so wedded together as to become a perfect unity. This commonwealth, this Christian commonwealth, must be presided over by the same prince, the representative of Peter, governed by the same laws, and held responsible to the same tribunal in the entire domain of faith and morals. There must be no discordance anywhere, from center to circumference. As Peter universal primacy and governed all Christians as the royal head of the church, he could not be a foreign prince in any part of the Christian commonwealth but by virtue of his divine appointment and God's unerring will, was a domestic prince throughout the whole extent. Does your Bible reveal any of this to you? No. Peter had no primacy. Peter was equal with all the other apostles. As we've touched on so many times on Inquisition Update, this is a colossal, misrepresentation of the Scriptures, and it is the very root and basis for the Roman Catholic Church. This idea that that Peter was primary, was a temporal ruler of the Church as well as a spiritual ruler of the Church, is absolute diabolical nonsense. And this nonsense has continued for 2,000 years in the person and office of the papacy. Now he continues, If therefore the Pope could not, without violating the the providential decree, consent to be governed by another prince at Rome, speaking of Victor Emmanuel, he could not consent to be governed by another prince or government or any earthly power whatsoever in any part of the world, Or if he did, he would forfeit his claim to universality of dominion, such as he alleges Peter to have possessed, and and thereby destroy the unity of the Roman Catholic Church, which would be offensive to God. With his mind persuaded by this process of reasoning, the Pope announced his independence of all human authority, and his supremacy over all governments and peoples in this strong language. Listen to what he says. Quote, Thinking and meditating on all these matters, we are bound anew to enforce and to profess that we have often, what we have oftentimes declared with our unanimous consent, that the civil sovereignty of the Holy See has been given to the Roman pontiff, that is the Pope, by a singular council of divine providence, and that it is of necessity, in order that the Roman Catholic Pope may exercise the supreme power and authority divinely given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, of feeding and ruling the entire flock of the Lord with the fullest of liberty, and may result from the greater good of the church, and its interests and needs 
that he shall never be subject to any prince or civil power. Unquote. This not only asserts that the civil sovereignty of the Pope is a matter of necessity, but explains that necessity by the assumed fact that it is conferred by divine providence with supremacy everywhere, so that by means of it he may rule the entire flock of Christians with the fullest of liberty, that is, without the interference of any civil power on earth. To this point, everything is settled without room for cavil or controversy. Beyond it, there lies this great question, full of interest to the entire world and especially to the Protestant portion of it. What degree of civil power must the Pope possess? How far shall he control the management of civil affairs in order that he may rule nations and peoples and keep them in line of duty to God and the papacy? When it is said that the Pope desires to absorb in his own hands all the powers of civil government elsewhere than in Rome, the accusation is probably too broad. Insofar as the laws and institutions of any of the nations regulate and direct the ordinary practical working of government, he could have no special motive of, for interference with them. As it regards these, it could be... It, it, it could make but little difference to the papacy whether they provided for one thing or another, or whether the machinery was in the hands of many or few, or whether they are such as commonly belong to the monarchy or a republic, would perhaps not concern him in the least. Judicial, revenue, postal, land, and other systems concerning local affairs alone and the ministerial duties pertaining to them are all matters which the Pope might be quite willing to leave undisturbed. It is to these, undoubtedly, that he and his followers refer when they talk about the affairs which legitimately belong to human governments. It should be conceded to them inasmuch as the declaration is made so frequently and with such apparent sincerity that with these they do not desire the Pope to interfere. But the question assumes an entirely different aspect when the policy of a government or its constitutions and laws touch upon or in any way affect religion or the Roman Catholic Church or the papacy, either directly or indirectly. All these involve inquiries which, by the papal theory, are exclusively within the spiritual jurisdiction of the Pope. They are within the domain of faith and morals, and as God has forbidden any human governments to enter upon this domain, everything that concerns religion or the Roman Catholic Church or the papacy is subject to the sovereign authority of the Pope as the successor of Peter. He alone possesses legitimate power to decide all questions of this nature, and therefore human governments cannot take cognizance of them in any form. Whenever they do, the state is placed above the church, because it undertakes to interfere with the faith. And as God designed in all such matters that the church should be above the state, all papists insist that whatever pertains to them shall be separated from human governments given in charge to the Roman Catholic Church or to the Pope, but inasmuch as the state must necessarily take jurisdiction of many things within the domain of morals, though not of faith, in order to keep society together and provide for the protection of person and property, the papal theory goes to the extent of requiring that insofar as these are concerned, the spiritual authority of the Pope shall include temporal authority to the extent of enabling him to prevent any infringement upon religion or the rights of the Roman Catholic Church or of the papacy. To this end, it is necessary that the Roman Catholic Church and the state should be united 
so that whenever the state invades the jurisdiction of the church, it may be brought back, peaceably if possible, but by coercion, by force if necessary, within its own legitimate sphere. Hence, the point at which the Pope's interference with the temporal affairs of the state begins is that at which, according to his theory, the spiritual and temporal jurisdictions unite in him. So long as the state stops short of this point, he does not seek to impair its function. But when it reaches it and seeks to go beyond it, then it becomes in contact with the sovereignty which by divine right belongs exclusively to him and must yield submission to it at the peril of violating the law of God. This sovereignty is conferred upon him as it was upon Peter that he may prevent either state or people from violating this law. And if that doesn't make him king of kings and lord of lords in violation of the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't know what else does. Now, we just, conti- we just concluded with a what is nothing more than a, an, an, an apparent concession by the papacy that the civil power, that is the state, has legitimate, some legitimate authority. Look, It's a pretense. If the papacy were not to concede some uh, temporal authority, legitimate temporal authority of the state, that would be going too far. And even the most loyal Roman Catholics would rebel against it. But trust me when I tell you, and if you don't trust me, trust R.W. Thompson. It's all a pretense. Because in the true interpretation of the words of the papacy, consistent through the ages, there is no civil power on this earth that does not derive that power from the papacy. And the papacy may overthrow or modify any government that defies his quote-unquote divine will. So there's no realm of civil authority that is not under the authority of the papacy. This concession is for window dressing only. But we'll continue. It says, when the papal authorities are pressed to the wall, that is, when they're put under extreme pressure, they concede that the, quote, state is supreme in its own order, and there is no power in temporals above it. Unquote. There's the phony concession, window dressing, conferring power upon, upon the state, and that there is no power above it. But he continues, but for fear, <clears throat> but for uh But for fear the concession will weaken the cause of the papacy, they insist that there is an order above the state, and to which it is subordinate, that is, the spiritual order of the kingdom of God on earth, or the order represented by the Roman Catholic Church. With them... The church is the guardian on earth of the rights of God and belongs to a higher order than that of the state. Therefore, the state lies in the subordinate and the church in the supreme. She sets up, they say, no claim of authority in this lower order in which the state lies, but as the rights of God are and should be, held to to be above the alleged rights of the empire, she cannot surrender anything which belongs to her as the custodian of these rights to the civil powers. To deny this, says a leading and able periodical, is to assert political atheism. We must obey God rather than man. In other words, we must obey the Pope rather than the governments of men. 
This is indirectly blasphemy, claiming that the Pope is the representative of God and we must obey him and not man. But I want to remind my listeners that the papacy is a man. It is of diabolical origin and not of God. Now, this leaves us to discover the line of partition between the two orders, that we may separate the higher from the lower, and thereby leave each to its proper jurisdiction. The Church, the Roman Catholic Church, represents the whole kingdom of God on earth, and therefore all the rights of God belong to her. Whatever these rights are, they pertain to the order in which the Church lies. The papist does not hesitate an instant in defining them. The pope has so frequently done it for him as to leave his mind in no doubt about them. They necessarily embrace in his view whatever pertains to faith and morals. In other words, all that concerns the Roman Catholic Church, its discipline, its government, its welfare, and its progress toward the final conquest of the world. R. W. Thompson just described for you the New World Order. They necessarily embrace in his view whatever pertains to faith and morals. In other words, all that concerns the Roman Catholic Church, its discipline, its government, its welfare, and its progress toward the final conquest of the world. They include also all questions of faith, everything pertaining to morals and the whole multitude of duties which men owe to God, to the church, and to society. As all these are within the sphere of the Pope's spiritual order and the guardianship of the Pope as the vicar of Christ, it belongs to him alone to define what they are. In doing so, he exercises his infallibility, and whatsoever he decides must be accepted as absolute truth, as he has no other witness but uh, no other witness but himself, stands alone in the world, and settles all questions concerning the extent and the nature of his own spiritual jurisdiction. So it depends upon him to declare what belongs to the superior or the spiritual and what to the inferior or the temporal order, what to the church and what to the state. The papist accepts the pope as, the, as standing in the place of God on earth. Therefore, when the pope makes an announcement of what is within the sphere of the spiritual order, that must be accepted by him as belonging to that order and as being removed entirely from the jurisdiction of the temporal order. When the Pope announces that he has what he has done, that the law of God does not allow freedom of religious faith or worship, or that the Roman Catholic Church cannot tolerate any opinions contrary to its teaching, or that the free, or that of free speech, free thought, and a free press are leading the world to perdition, or that the Roman Catholic Church and the state should be united, or that his priestly hierarchy throughout the world should, con should constitute a privileged class, and I'll just interject, this is what the know-nothings call the rich ruling elite, it's the Roman Catholic priestly hierarchy. It says, Or that his hierarchy throughout the world should constitute a privileged class, not subject to the laws which govern others, or any of those other innumerable things about which he has written so frequently and so much, then all these matters are removed from the temporal jurisdiction, and the state must not dare to lay her unhallowed hands upon them. They belong to the supreme order in which the Roman Catholic Church stands alone. They pertain to the rights of God, which, of which the Pope is the only earthly guardian. 
Therefore, upon all questions of this nature, according to the papal theory, the Roman Catholic Church, that is, the Pope, because remember, he is the Church, must be superior to and above the state, so that the state may be kept within its own inferior order, or if permitted to go beyond it, then whatsoever it does shall be done under the supervision of the spiritual order and in conformity with its commands. And this is what the Pope and the defenders of his personal infallibility mean when they talk about keeping the Roman Catholic Church in its supreme and the state in its subordinate order. Whenever the state infringes upon the jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church, it must be taught that it has wandered out of its legitimate sphere. And when warned of its transgression, if it continues to lay its impious hands upon holy things, the papal lash is applied without mercy. History is crowded with instances where interdicts, excommunications, the releasing of citizens from their national allegiance, and pontifical anathemas in every variety of form have been visited upon the heads of such offenders. We shall become familiar with some of these at the proper time as they rise up before us in that marvelous order of events which mark the progress of the papacy. Now, when we come to make a practical application of this papal theory to our own national state policy, so as to see what the Pope meant in his encyclical of 1871 when he said that he must have the fullest liberty to rule the entire flock of the Lord and that in doing so he must not be subject to any civil power, there's no difficulty in seeing where, in his view, we have gone beyond the limits of the temporal order and offended against the Roman Catholic Church and the true faith. All our constitutions, national and state, have forbidden a religious establishment, have separated the affairs of the state from those of the church by breaking the old bond of union between them. There's a direct reference to the old world order, which is to be restored in the new world order, the union of church and state. It is the defining characteristic. Watch, listen, and learn. When you see the state acting for the church, you know the new world order is in place. Now, think long and hard about that. And if you do, you will confirm with me that the new world order is already up and running. He says, all of our institutions, national and state, have forbidden a religious establishment. No establishment of religion. Why? Because Roman Catholicism was the established religion of the old world order. Religious persecution was rampant. The rivers of Europe ran blood red with the the bodies, the dead floating bodies of those who rebelled against the authority of the Pope and wished to worship God according to their, their Bibles. All our constitutions, national and state, have forbidden a religious establishment, have separated the affairs of the state from those of the church by breaking the old bond of union between them we have left every man's conscience entirely free so that he may entertain whatsoever form of religious faith it shall dictate, or none, if that shall seem to him consistent with duty. We have provided for the utmost freedom of speech and of the press. We have made all the laws dependent upon the consent of the people, and every citizen, no matter what his condition, obedient to them and have guarded against any possible encroachments other the, other, uh, encroachment other great principles which we consider as belonging to the very fundamentals of civil government. 
Is any man so ignorant as not to know that all these, every single one of these, have been denounced not only by Pope Pius IX, but many of his predecessors? What R.W. Thompson has just pointed out to you in minute detail is that this government is diametrically opposed to the papacy, and the papacy will do whatever it must to overthrow this government. And he has an entire fifth column of devout Roman Catholics, priests, and hierarchy in every facet of our society, from street sweeper to the President of the United States, the Supreme Court, Congress, the House of Representatives, Senate, everywhere. And at his bidding, they will overthrow this government. And the new world order will be recognized as nothing but the res restoration of the old world order. And again, the rivers of this great nation will run red with the blood of Protestants. Be forewarned. Have nothing to do with the ecumenical movement of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in his view, they involve matters which do not legitimately belong to civil government in the narrow and contracted sphere in which he would confine them. They pertain to the spiritual order and are therefore within the circle of the spiritual jurisdiction. That is the unique jurisdiction of the Pope, as they claim. Now they affect the true faith, infringe upon the rights of the Roman Catholic Church, they limit the authority of the papacy, curtail the rightful powers of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, give encouragement to heresy and infidelity, and for these and other reasons are defiant to the laws of God. Therefore God has imposed upon him, as the successor of Peter, the obligation of declaring that they are impious in his sight and of employing all the weapons in the pontifical army for, the ex for their extermination. There you go. That's where we're headed. By divine right, the Pope must exterminate this heresy. This government, in the papacy's view, was a product of the Protestant Reformation, which he has already labeled as heresy and rebellion, spiritual atheism, not accepting the vicar of Christ, not accepting God's representative, only his only representative on earth. And therefore, it must be overthrown. That and Protestantism and the Bible that is the basis and foundation under all of it. Extermination. It always, it always ends in that, doesn't it, with the papacy. The earth has opened her mouth to swallow the blood of the prophets and the saints and all the slain of the earth, and they were all slain at the hand of this diabolical papacy. If you can be a regular listener to the Inquisition update, we'll explain eventually, piece by piece, all how all the wars of the world have been fought for the benefit of the papacy. And this is what happens when we fail to recognize what God said in His Word about this Antichrist power. You ask a Christian today, well, who is the Antichrist? Well, it must be Barack Obama or you know, uh, uh, Mitt Romney or somebody else. And if you suggest it's the papacy, why, he's a man of God. How could we be so ignorant in this country? How could we call ourselves Christians and not know that power that has killed so many of God's people throughout history? How could, be we, how could we be so unwilling to accept the undeniable truth? 
And how can we excuse ourselves from not fighting against it, exposing it at every turn? Come what may. How could we so passively acquiesce to the most diabolical method of attracting the Protestants back into the Roman Catholic Church, the ecumenical movement? I'm telling you, in my mind, it's the last straw. It's the absolute last straw. When the Israelites began to worship Baal, God punished them. And that's what's going to happen in this country. We've given up Christ, and in the name of Christ, we've accepted Antichrist in this country. We allow him to come to this, this country in 2008 without a single protest. Where's Protestantism? Where is it? It's not visible in this country. It's not audible in this country. Does it even exist? King James Bibles on every coffee table in this country. But no Protestantism. How can that be? R.W. Thompson continues, and thus, to the extent of being enabled to regulate all these matters according to the command of God and the requirements of the Roman Catholic Church, by striking them from our constitutions and repealing all the statutes passed under their preservation, he considers that God has united both spiritual and temporal authority in his hands and that the civil power of this country has no just right to place the slightest impediment in his way. The nation must bow in humiliation and disgrace before him, so that as the papal car rides in triumph over it, the last remembrance of the work of our fathers shall be crushed out. And I'm very sorry that even R.W. Thompson failed to, pre to precede the word fathers with Protestant. The nation must bow in humiliation and disgrace before the Pope, so that as the papal car rides in triumph over it, the last remembrance of the work of our Protestant fathers shall be crushed out. Already the censures of the Pope rest upon whatever he finds in the civil policy of all the nations violative of his rights and of that of his church or of God's law as he interprets it. The governments of Italy, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, and Brazil have deemed it expedient for their own domestic peace and protection to adopt certain measures which are designed, among other things, to require every citizen to obey the law of the state and thereby to prevent sedition. It cannot be denied that they had the right to pass these laws by all the principles which nations recognize. They have relation to questions which concern their own domestic economy, questions which each nation has the exclusive right to decide for itself. The laws have been enacted in proper form and with the usual solemnity, so that they should be considered as expressing, in each case, the will of the nation. Yet, because they affect the interests of the Roman Catholic Church, have taken from some of its favorite orders a portion of their temporal wealth, have, have prohibited the Roman Catholic prelates from teaching sedition, and have required them to conform to the law, the Pope has fulminated against these states the most terrible anathemas. They have invaded his spiritual jurisdiction because the laws they've enacted, although in reference to temporalities, affect the affairs of the papacy and weaken its power. 
Therefore, Pope Pius IX, professedly speaking, says, In the name of Jesus Christ and by the authority of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, I admonish the, the authors of these measures that they should take pity on their souls and not continue to treasure up for themselves wrath against the day of wrath and of the revelation of the just judgment of God." Unquote. And not only does the Pope thus assume jurisdiction to denounce and to condemn the authors of these measures of civil policy and the measures themselves, but he compliments and applauds his adherents for their disobedience to the laws, although subjects of and owing allegiance to the governments enacting them. The papacy overthrows governments simply by calling Roman Catholics into rebellion against it. And that's what's happening in this country. It's happening in broad daylight, in the full view of the world. Why won't we recognize it and call it what it is? The Pope's New World Order. Put the blame where it belongs. Identify Antichrist. We'll continue with our program tomorrow. Yeah.